Well, good evening. It's good to see each and every one this afternoon. I uh, appreciate everyone coming back out tonight. We're going to get started tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, is there any new prayer request? If you would, continue to remember Brother or Sister Ray Campbell. Also, uh, Linda Dinkins, as she'll be having surgery. Uh, we're thankful for the praise report of Brother Danny Marsh. That he's feeling better. Also, remember uh, Rachel Chester. You know, I know we have some unspokens. Also, Tina Comer, as she goes for some tests concerning uh, Cushing's disease there, so prayerfully she won't have to have another brain surgery. They're talking about that, so continue to pray for her. Brother uh, Bill Rubin, continue to pray for him. Also, the Michelle Wallace family, continue to pray for them. And then the little Teddy Whittington, uh, continue to pray for that little young baby, 18 months old, actually had some good news. He's actually breathing some on his own and coughing, so the doctors have said that's expected. got a long ways to go, but continue to pray for him. Of course, I uh, continue to pray for my sister, also Kathy Martin, and then, of course, uh, Brother Mark Freeman. He was here this morning. Thank the Lord for his healing after his uh, back surgery. Is there any other prayer request at this time? Yes. Yes, I'd like to send my son, Justin, 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 Any other prayer request? Yes. Any other prayer request? Yes. Any other prayer request tonight? Yes. What was that first name? Daltrey is his first name, Daltrey. Dalton. Any other prayer requests tonight? Yes. Any others? Unspoken. Any others tonight? Uh, yes, yes. Any others? Any others? All right. If there's no others, we'll go to the Lord in prayer tonight. And I believe you got a song after that, right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you again today just thanking you, Lord, for just another day. You bless us with, Lord. We thank you so much for the great turnout this morning, Father, and the services this morning, Lord, and the songs that were sung, the word that was shared, Father. Lord, I just pray again and just give you the praise and glory for that, Lord. And as we come tonight, Lord, once again, I'm thankful for each and every one that's came back out to your house tonight, Father, to just come and worship you, Lord, through song and through message, Lord. And, Father, as we hear these prayer petitions again, Lord, some of them we've uh, had on a prayer request list for quite a while, Lord, but we're thankful, Lord, that we know that you still hear those uh, prayer request even now, Lord, and Father, that you're working in a great and mighty way in each and individual life, Lord, during this time, Lord, and Father, I know we've had some new ones added today, Father, and Lord, there's so many things going on within so many families' lives, Lord, with cancer and different other diseases, Lord, and just so much going on, but I'm thankful again tonight to know that we have a Heavenly Father, Lord, that sticks closer than that brother that walks through, Father, uh, the turmoil and things that we face on this earth, Lord. And thankful so much, Lord, that, Father, I still serve a God that still answers prayers, Lord, Father. And we're thankful for that, Lord. And I'm just praying now, Father, again, as always, Lord, that your will would be done in each life, Lord, knowing, Father, that full well, Lord, that you can heal and meet each, ne each need, Father, that is mentioned tonight, Father, on this list, Lord. Father, just let us look to you each and every day in times when we don't understand what's going on and know that you are a faithful and, uh, and a faithful and great God, Lord, and that you're working in those situations, Father. Lord, help us to continue to pray for those folks, Lord, that in their family, Lord, church family and friends, Lord. Father, help us to just give each one some encouragement during these times, Lord, and just point them to you, Father, for that comfort, Lord. Lord, we thank you again now for how you're going to touch. We thank you again now for the praise reports even that we've heard already, Father, this morning. And, Father, we're looking forward to those praise reports, Lord, that we're going to hear even this week, Lord. 
And Lord, we just give it all to you now. I just thanking you, Father, for your marvelous grace, mercy, provision, and love you bestow upon us each day. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Everybody will stand. We're going to sing There is Power in the Blood. <clears throat> you be free from your burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power, power wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb could have our youth come up for special prayer time before you're dismissed to your class. While they're coming up, just a reminder of announcements, of course. This coming week, Bible study Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we'll be back in the book of Acts, picking back up. We'll be leaving Barnabas after we've been studying Barnabas for a while. We'll be picking back up in Acts chapter 5. And then, of course, uh, any candy donations is appreciated for our, our, our kids uh, Easter celebration next Saturday. That'll be March the 30th. And there again, we're looking forward to what the Lord's going to do there. If you got any candy, we would like to have that if you're able to donate that. And then, of course, any uh, donations for our sunrise service breakfast, which will be at uh, sunrise service at 6.30, sunrise uh, breakfast at 7 o'clock, and then uh, regular service at 8.30. So looking forward to that. And then, of course, the sign-up sheet is still in the back. If you haven't signed up for the uh, women's luncheon, Please do that. Invite someone, as I said before, to try to reach those that are unchurched. And there again, all are welcome for that. And that will be on Saturday, April the 27th. And I believe that's all the announcements that we have at this time. Let us pray. Most gracious, wonderful Father, we want to thank you for letting us be in your house again this evening. Thank you for the beautiful day that you gave us. Thank you for the service this morning and the word that was preached let us apply it to our lives please be with all the youth that are here put your protective arms around them as they go through the week keep them safe and let them keep them their eyes on you throughout the whole week in jesus name we pray amen what a blessing to have all these kids here
Thank you, Lord, for that. We could have our ushers come forward for the offering at this time. Somebody lost their sock. One of y'all lose your sock. Just, they wanted to get out of here so quick. They lost their sock. Run out of it. Let's pray. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before the throne this evening, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for each and every blessing you bestow upon us, Father. And Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you'd just be with us, Lord, that you'd help us to be that witness outside the walls of this church, Father. Lord, as we're out and about, Father, we just pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you'd give us the strength and the courage to stand up and to be bold, Father, for time is running out. And Father God, we ask you now, Lord, to touch those that are sick and afflicted. Lord, there's so many, Lord, that just need a touch of the Master's hand. And Father God, we just pray, if it be thy will, Lord, you would just touch and minister the way you see fit, Father. Father, most of all, we pray for that one that's lost and undone, Lord, that one that don't know you as Lord and Savior. We ask you, Lord, to draw them in before it's eternally too late. Father God, now we just ask your blessing on this offering, Lord, as we receive, Father. We just pray, Lord, that it would be to the fullness of your kingdom. We pray for the gift and the giver, the one that has to give and the one that has not, Father. Just bless and minister now. And Father God, we just ask you to place our pastor behind the middle cross tonight, Lord. Give him that word that needs to be spoken. Give us the ears to hear. And Lord, help us to apply it to our hearts as we go outside these walls. Father God, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe we have a special or two tonight. I think, Josie, are you singing tonight, honey? Come on up here.
phone. Under his wings, I tell you what, I, I've shared this story before, but I was uh, sitting there thinking about that. I was thinking about them old game chickens I used to raise and just a huge frog strangler thunderstorm. The hen I really liked had got gone. I thought she's gone. Fox got her something, killed her. And just during that storm, I happened to look out the window just right after the storm. The sun had come up, and I looked out there, and there she was just soaking wet like this right here. And then all of a sudden, I looked, and I seen a little head peep out. And she had 18 bitties under her, and every one of them was dry. And my, my, I thought, Lord... Just as that hen is protecting those babes from that mighty, mighty storm, I have somebody greater, and his name's called Jesus Christ, that protects me from the storms of life. Amen. I tell you what, God can use his creation and nature to speak to every one of us if we'll take the time and opportunity to, to observe that. Do you know that? Hallelujah, and thank the Lord. Well, Brother Larry, he was able to find a little time. He's a busy man. He was in around and about. And Brother Larry, if you come on up here tonight, and I don't, he don't need no welcome. You know, you know him. He's been here very often, and I'm just thankful tonight he was able to come and be with us tonight. And he's going to share the word with us tonight, brother. And I appreciate you, and I love you, and this be, and thank you for what you stand for, brother. Love you, brother. And God bless you. Mm -hmm. Hello, church. Hey. The ecclesiasta or ecclesia. It's good to see you today. Do you know what? This is a wonderful season. This is our season. This is the season we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, we have something that the other one, 4,100 religions do not have. All of them have bones and ashes. We have an empty tomb because our Lord was resurrected and came out alive victorious. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Isn't that wonderful, though? John chapter 11 tonight. And Mike, it's good to see you. Thank you for the privilege to speak in your behalf. And it's good to be back here at Emmanuel Baptist Church and see so many of our friends. Let me give you a, just a disclosure. This is the most remarkable that Jesus performed in John. There are seven miracles, and the climactic miracle is found in John chapter 11 where Jesus raises this Lazarus. Now, what's interesting, as you study the Synoptic Gospels, you do not find the raising of Lazarus in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. One of the reasons for that is because John is written on a different level. However, in those Gospels, we find the climactic thing that causes them to go after him to want to kill the Lord happens to be with the cleansing of the temple. But when you come to John's Gospel, you find the climactic event which they want to stone him and kill him. And even in John chapter 12, you find it, is that the raising of Lazarus. What a profound miracle that it had. Now, I want to give you this disclaimer. You will hear me interchange the words from resurrection to restoration. Now, strictly speaking, the term is used of the experience of Lazarus here because he came from death to life. And so we normally think of resurrection from that viewpoint. But theologically and doctrinally speaking, the scriptures tells us that only one person who has ever really been resurrected, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20 says, he is the first fruits, meaning that he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected to newness of life, never ever to die again. And so it's the first fruits. And what I love about that is symbolic of the Old Testament. It was the first of many more yet to come. And because of his resurrection, all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though their bodies die, there is coming a day with the trump of God, with the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall be, listen to these words, resurrected to a life that will never, ever die. So that's of that. But you said, Brother Larry, I thought I've read through my Bible, and I've noticed there are some resurrections in the Old Testament as well as the New. Yes, there are three in the Old Testament. One of them is found in 1 Kings chapter 17, when Elijah raises the widow's son. And then the other one is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18 to 37. Elijah raises the Shulamite's son. And then I love this last one. It's found in 2, Korean, 2 Kings chapter 13, 21. A dead man, and they were in a hurry, threw his body in and hit the bones of Elisha. And as soon as that dead man's body hit those bones, life came to him, and he sprung to life and came out of that tomb. That had to be quite an experience for those that threw him in. 
Now, on three occasions in the New Testament, we find people being restored back to life. Jesus raises Jarvis' daughter, found in Matthew chapter 9, 23 to 25. Then he raises the centurion's son, and the centurion is a powerful man. Evidently, it was a man who had much faith in God. And so he sent message to Jesus that his servant was sick. And he didn't even so much as come to him. He said, I'm a man of authority. You're a man of authority. I speak to this to one man, and he does this, speak to another. You don't even so much as need to come to my house. All you've got to do is speak. The Lord turned around and said this, I have not seen so much faith as this in all of Israel. And he was raised. Then in John chapter 11, Jesus raises this Lazarus from the dead. It's a statement that I've learned, and I've just thought about this a few years ago. There can be no resurrection unless there is a death. No resurrection unless there's a death. I hope you have your Bibles with you in John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. And it was that Martha which was anointed the Lord with her ointment and wiped her feet with her hair, and his brother Lazarus was sick. We find that in John chapter 12. After the raising of Lazarus, Simon the leper, and by the way, he's all referred to as a leper, but he was healed. So it went in his old house, evidently it's a cleanse house, he's gone through the ceremonial cleaning, and Martha prepares a meal. Mary is so grateful for what the Lord has done, she takes a very costly spikener, which is about 300 uh, pence, that is, of uh, wages, uh, the denaro, that is, and she anointed the Lord. She just didn't anoint his feet. She pulled it on his hair, uh, on his head, and ran down to his feet, then she did something that's very uncommon. She took her hair and cleansed the Lord's feet with that and wept over the Lord as she was doing it. Out such gratitude for what God has done. So that's who they are. And by the way, when you begin to notice reading the scriptures, plus in John chapter 12, you'll find that the name Martha is given before Mary, probably rendering the fact that Martha was the older of the two. So they have a brother named Lazarus from the name Elaz. It's a Hebrew word that is translated into the Greek, and it's a word that means God is my helper. Isn't that amazing? Lazarus names God is my helper. And so that it was that Mary, which anointed the Lord's feet with her hair, down in verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto the Lord, unto him, saying, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Jesus didn't have many secure places to go to and homes in this earth. But there was one home found in Bethany, which is about two, and, about two miles from Jerusalem. He would often find a place where he could go and find rest. He could find fellowship. He could find comfort. And he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And when Lazarus was sick, notice the wording, He whom thou lovest is sick, speaking the deep love that Jesus had. And then Jesus heard that. He said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he bowed two days still in the place where he was. Then after that saith he unto his disciples, Let us go unto Judea again. And the disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and thou and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? And if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Sounds a little bit out of place, doesn't it? But in the Greek, it is called an idiomatic statement, meaning Jesus saying this. He said, Notice he didn't say the light of the world, but the light in him. Jesus is saying there's a time that we have appointed to work. And when that time comes to an end, there's no more work to be done. We that are older can look back and realize that we have probably wasted a lot of time within our life of doing the Lord's work. And the Lord is emphasizing here that we need to do the work while there's energy, while there's life within us. A few years ago, I had gone to my doctor, and I remember being down in Pinehurst, and they had done some catheterizations, and the doctor said, I have good news and bad news. And he said, which do you want? I said, well, give me the good news first. It'll make more palatable the bad news. He said, well, the good news is you have no blockages in your stents or in your heart. The bad news is you got hardened in the arteries and just walked out. I had absolutely no idea what that meant. 
I may have studied Bible, but I am not a medical doctor. Amen. So I go to my cardiologist, and I talk to him, and he says, let me tell you something. He said, you have plaque building up in your arteries. I could be standing right beside you. That plaque could break off. Go to your heart. You could die of a heart attack. Go to your brain, and you can have a stroke. And there's absolutely nothing that me or no one else can do for you at that moment. Now, folks, he got my attention. But then he said something else. He said, Larry, God has designed the heart to beat X number of beats. And when that expiration beat comes, there's absolutely nothing, nobody on the face of God's green earth can do for you to make that heart have another beat. Jesus says there are 12 hours in a day. You need to be wise when you use this and know when to use the time because the time is coming. Our time will come to an end. So that's what the idiomatic verse there may mean. Then he said to his disciples, but in verse 12, he said these things, and after he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. The disciples said, Lord, if he is asleep, he shall do well. How bid Jesus spake of it his death, but they that thought he had spoken of resting in sleep. And Jesus said in them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For I'm glad for your sakes I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless... Let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus. And by the way, I'm a Didymus. Didymus simply means a twin. We're never told Thomas's twin brother's name. There's no record in the Bible of him saying anything. But some of you said Thomas is the old kind of gloomy old guy, gloomy guy all the time just saying something negative. I don't know about you, but Thomas is saying what we want to say, and we're afraid to say it. And Thomas said, well, I guess we'll just go die with you. He just said, we'll go die with Lazarus. He said, we'll go with you because, see, just in chapter 10, where Jesus gave the greatest statement about him being equal with God the Father in verse 30. Now it says they want to stone him to death because of this. And Thomas says, well, I reckon if we go there, they'll just stone you, and I'll die with you when they stone you to death. Then Jesus came, and he found that they had laid in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nine in Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs or two miles off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And by the way, at that time, there was professional people that would come and mourn. And the louder that you mourn, and the louder that you cried, and the louder that you wailed, meant the deeper love that you had for an individual, and the greater that you had missed them. So they had come to the house to join them in their time of grieving, and they would cry loud, and they were, and they were there. And in verse 20, and Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Mary still staying with the people, being a polite host. Then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. I want you to listen to me. You can go to church your entire life. You can pray 12 hours a day. You can give until you can't give. You can work until his blood's coming out of your fingers. But you cannot coerce God to do something. God is God, and God has a plan. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous, righteous man availeth much. But listen, when God's plans overrules our plans, and she said, I, I know that you could heal my brother. We know that you have the gift of healing. If you'd only been here, if you'd been here earlier, he wouldn't have died. But I know this, Jesus, that whatever you ask of God the Father, he will give it to thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him that I know he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He did not say I am a resurrection and a life. He was inclusive with the definite article, the resurrection, the life. Listen to me. He is exclusive. No one else has resurrection power. No one else has life in them except Jesus Christ, God equal his son. He is the one is life. And you can't get life from a book. You don't get life from a friend. You don't get life from a relationship. You get life from Jesus. For Colossians says, Christ who, when he appears, who is our life? Life comes only from him. She said to him, Yea, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the God, which should come into the world. The greatest statement for the reason the Gospel of John is written. I believe thou art the Messiah, Christos, the anointed one, the one that should come. 
What a great testimony. The gospel of John is written for that. And when she had so said, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master has come, calleth for thee. Father in heaven, we thank you for this recorded passage. Because as we go through this season of our life now celebrating what we call the Passion Week, Lord, as we go through this and next Sunday we celebrate the resurrection, may we realize that the, the Lazarus gives us a true illustration and example of that eternal life that lives within us that only comes from you. Speak to our hearts. You know the needs. These folks, Father, have come to church tonight not just to be blessed, but to have an encounter with God, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Thank you for the shepherd of his flock. Bless him, Lord. Thank you for his powerful sermon you gave him this morning. Now, Lord, speak to us in these few moments we have. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. John chapter 11 is truly an illustration of what life is about in the New Testament. The Nazareth of John 11 causes us to want to ask three questions. Number one, is there life beyond the grave? Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. There's deep down in the heart of every person that believes there is life beyond the grave. Death doesn't end at all. Secondly, can we have a life that goes beyond the grave? Did you realize that last year a survey was taken said 47% of atheists who don't even believe in God said they believe there is some kind of life that is beyond death. Three, so if there is a life, can I possess that life? Three, can I know for it that I can possess it that goes beyond death? The only person who is qualified in a quantitative way to answer this is the one who came, who lived, who died, and was resurrected to newness of life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who has life. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11, chapter, John chapter, uh, John chapter, going blank on me here, 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And then also in Colossians 3, 4, where he says, Christ, who is our life. When you read the gospel of John through, you will find there are 41 times the word life Zoe, and another form of the word, Greek word, is given to us. Now, I'll not bore you with all those. But while we read our text, there's an affirmative answer, yes, to all three of those questions. Yes, there is life beyond the grave. Yes, we can have a life that goes beyond the grave. And number three, and we can know that we possess a life that death does not end. Now, John's gospel was written to bring men to life that they may know that life. So it's a climactic sign. Jesus raises a dead man to the life. The whole purpose of John is to show us those who are dead in their trespasses of sin, how we can be forgiven and become alive in Jesus Christ. So let's look at this, eternal life. You know what eternal life is? It doesn't begin the moment you die. I remember preaching in West Virginia, and the pastor came to me at the end of the service. He said, you know, I never thought of that. I thought eternal life began when I died. He said, this is the first time in my life I realized at the moment of my conversion, the life of God comes within me by the person, the Holy Spirit, and now I have a life that shall never, ever die, and it is called eternal life. Amen. 22 years ago, I would received a phone call as we had just arrived in Northern Virginia, and I was to speak at our home and sending church. My brother had called me and said, Larry... Mother's in intensive care in Summers County Hospital, and they're not giving her a chance to live. We immediately, I call my pastor that night, tell him I will not be there the next morning. We drive, we arrive around 1 or 2 in the morning to the hospital. One of the doctors is there, and he said, we, one of the Henderson sons said, yes, I am. He said, your mother has had the worst echocardiogram we have ever seen in her life. It is impossible for her to live. How she's hanging on, we do not know, but she will not survive this. Anyway, during that week, as my twin sister, my sister Betty, and we younger kids were there and say, younger, we have five older and we have five younger in our family. We were with her, and my mother asked this question. She says, Linda, am I dying? I'm the preacher's son. I, my brother Richard is the son, is also a preacher. 
I'm listening now of all of a sudden, my ears pierce, and I think, how would I answer this to my mother? How is my twin sister going to answer mom? Is she going to mellow it down and make it pl more pl palatable? Or is she just, what is she going to say? As we stood there in silence, Linda says, yes, mom, you are dying. My mother said, I am not afraid to die. Can you sit here tonight and honestly say that? That you're not afraid to die. You may be like David Jeremiah said. He said, I don't want to die in pain. And I've never faced death before, so there's a lot of uncertainty about it. But he said, about dying, I am not afraid. My mother told me more about theology the last week she was alive than any Bible professor I ever had in my life. So the Christian life is a supernatural life. There's nothing ordinary about the Christian life. It's not a religious life. It's not the legalistic religious life where I live by all the standards and the dress and the acts and know how to do the right moves and all the time. That's religious, legalistic life doesn't give life. It's a supernatural life from the beginning to the end. And it's a life that God implants into your spirit is listen to this, it's a life that the Holy Spirit nurtures, He leads, and He matures in our life. It means this, we're constantly growing in our walk with God. It's a life that is altogether of God. So if anyone in the entire Word of God actually would illustrate what a supernatural life is, you would look at Lazarus and said, wow, here was a man that was four days old. He stank, he was decayed, and now he's alive. He illustrates what it is to have newness of life. That's not exaggerating. When I look at you and when you look at me, there ought to be something supernaturally different about our life that is if you're born again. If you see something supernatural about me, the very life of Jesus, and I've said this before, it's like the aura of God about us. So number one, there are several steps. Lazarus had two sisters lived in Bethany. The names were Martha and Mary. They had sent news to the Lord saying, He whom thou lovest is sick. Now verse 6 says Jesus stayed where he was at two more days. And you think, that's strange. He loves him, and he loves him very dearly. Why didn't he move then? Why didn't he go as soon as he heard that he was sealed? And of course Jesus says this is for the sickness, not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus stayed where he was at, listen to this, because it was the will of the Heavenly Father. Jesus did exactly what God the Father wanted. Now, the Jews had a very a unique set of customs and beliefs about a dead body. They believed that when a person died, the spirit would come back once every day. And then on the fourth day, when the spirit would come back, he would see the decomposition that set in, the swelling of the flesh, the body was almost unrecognizable, and he would leave forever, never to return again. So in the four days old, they definitely didn't, could say this, he is dead. And that's why that Martha says, Lord, he's a four-day-old dead person. He stinketh. So why remove the stone? That's the first coming to life. The miracles and signs to look at just more than physical terms, they are to be applied to us spiritually. Let me give you a little quote. What's the first thing you said after you were born again? I am alive for the first time of my life. There's something within me that has life that has never had it before. I remember as a 15-year-old boy walking outside of the church that night in a June summer night and looking up at the stars and as if they had come out on dress parade for the first time, I knew and felt that God was my Father. I felt alive like I have never felt in my entire life. So undoubtedly, Lazarus was dead. It has spiritual implications that goes all the way back to the garden. Adam, you can eat of every tree that's in the garden except one. And the day that you eat, you're going to die. Adam ate and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. They did not die physically right then, but they died spiritually. Their ability to communicate with God was dead. And every person who was outside of Jesus Christ has not been born again, is dead spiritually toward God and needs for the spirit to be quickened and made alive. And Lazarus illustrates that. What is the definition for spiritual death? 
separation from God. You may look religious. You may be full of good works. You may be a good neighbor. But if you're not born again, you're spiritually dead. And you need to be saved, born from above. Now, Lazarus illustrates the fact that men are spiritually dead. When Jesus came to Bethany, he stayed outside for a while. And all of a sudden, Martha comes to him with a complaint. Lord, if you had been here, when we called for you to come, our brother had not died. But we know now that whatever you ask of God, he will do it, and he will give it to thee. Martha wants Jesus to go to God and through God to get something from God. But we learn something very important here. Jesus does not have to go through God. He is not just an agent of God. He is God himself. Jesus said to her in verse 23, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha knew the Pharisaical view. She knew that there would be what they were taught by the Pharisees. There's a general resurrection. But then Jesus explodes with her with a great statement, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He is exclusive. There's no life. There's no resurrection in no one else but in him. There's not two ways to heaven. There's not ten ways to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. I have heard out of Baptist preachers saying this, there's got to be another way. What about the heathen? What about the people live on an isle? What about so-and-so is there? Somehow God makes a way even though they hadn't heard about Jesus. Well, if you say that, you might as well take the Bible and throw it in the trash can. For Jesus says, I am the way. No other way. He said, I am. I'm not a doctrine. I am a person. In Exodus chapter 3 and in verse 14, Moses says, Who am I to tell them that I've sent me? I am that I am. I'm the self-existing God that that does not rely upon no one else. I need nothing else, for he is God in God alone. He tells Martha, I am both the causes and the consequences to resurrection. And he plainly tells us that he is the resurrection because he is life. Notice 41 times in the gospel of John, life, the word life is used. Colossians 3, 4 says, when Christ who is the life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. For Christ possesses a life that passes through death. Because he has the inedible consequences of his death will be resurrection. Resurrection is nothing more than victory over death. I like to be very personal with you. The resurrection is no hope of yours if you've never been born again. I was telling B this morning, I was thinking of it, and we were driving to, to Bethany Baptist Church, and we pulled up into the parking lot, and right in front of, to the right of us a little bit, there was the cemetery, the church cemetery. And it reminded me of a story that I heard, that a guy is a caretaker of a cemetery, of a large cemetery, and he's a lay speaker. So he travels a lot, and he preaches, and people oftentimes ask him, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, I am the manager of an underground condominium. Now, isn't that really true? Out here, listen, we don't believe in soul sleep. We believe in the physical body sleeps. And we all know this, that Sister Lib, when we placed in the ground Brother Elmer there, there's a day coming when the trump of God shall sound. That body will rise to life again. Hallelujah, because of Jesus Christ's life. So if you want to say, that's just an underground condominium making a pleasant place for our bodies of our loved ones to lay until when the voice of God is sound and just as he said, Lazarus come forth, they will come forth victorious over, over that grave one day. And Jesus came. And as he got to the grave, he saw Mary and Martha weeping. And listen to the Greek word. English translation, and he groaned. The Greek word there, according to A.W. Criswell, is a loud word, but it's entire, an articulate noise. Now, why does Jesus groan in the spirit? As one of our modern-day writers said this, because the tears and the griefs of Mary and Martha moved Jesus. God sees the tears of the, grief, the stricken one and moved with compassion. He sees our tears. He's touched by our tears. He remembers our tears. He dries our tears. Jesus saw the result of sin, and he groaned at the power of sin that death had and knew that he would be victorious over death. He used the word he showed compassion, and the Greek word is 
spotsnitsoma, meaning deep down for men. It is the greatest word that they could come up with for the word of compassion. He was moved from every fiber of his being, and he's grown in his spirit. The classical Greek word is like horses snorting. It's unintelligible as he stood there and groaned with them as he stood outside of Lazarus' tomb. And then the Bible says this, Jesus wept. Jesus shares in the griefs and sorrows of those that mourn. Yet, like no other, God the Son was able to do something about their grief. Let me give you some glorious news. What Jesus did for Lazarus, listen to me, Jesus will do for you and our loved ones. Jesus wept. There are many things we can learn from these two words. He was truly a man. Jesus knew what it was like to be sad. Three times in the New Testament, Jesus wept. In Luke 19, 41, as Jesus stood outside of Jerusalem, as he was coming in and could see Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long would I be like a mother hen? Would take you under my wings, and you would not. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us then in John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, that he wept in the day of when he was shedding tears for our redemption. Isaiah says, 53, 3 says, he's a man acquainted with sorrow, acquainted with grief. Some of you here today, you're going through a sad time in your life. Remember, when you don't have strength to draw nigh to God, God draws nigh to you. Where do you get that from? Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is near to those that have a broken heart. When your loved one is gone, when your loved one is dead, and when you know that you will no longer hear that voice again, or touch that hand again, or have that warm embrace from that loved one again, your heart is saddened and broken in there. God, the Father, understands through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. He comes as if he takes us up in his hands, lifts us up, and embraces us, and carries us through the most difficult time of our life. Casting your care in him, for he careth for you. That includes our burdens, our griefs, our questions, even our frustrations. There's no shame in tears. Jesus was not ashamed of his humanity. Jesus identified with others in his sorrows. Jesus loves people. He wept because he saw the power of sin, and he wept because he really, really loved Lazarus and his two sisters. So the next steps are very short. Jesus knows to know the love of God. It's true that Jesus came in order that God might save man, but Jesus didn't come in order that God may love man, for God has always loved man. Notice in verses 41 to 43, the third step. 41 to 43, and as we begin reading, picking up in the latter part of 41. And Jesus says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou shouldest hear me always, but because of the people which I stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. This is the same God who Genesis 1 stood on eternity of nothing, spoke, and everything came into existence. Now stands outside of the grave of a four-day-old dead man whose body is decomposing, and he stands from there, and Jesus speaks, and he comes forth alive from that grave. He cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The Greek, there's two adverbs, hither forth. In the Greek, it would read like this, Lazarus, duro exo, come forth. When God speaks, it must be obeyed. It was Martin Luther said, if Jesus had not spoken Lazarus, all of the dead in the cemeteries of the entire world would came forth forth and resurrection of life. Jesus is the one who has power over death. He shouted, Lazarus, hither out. And when a dead man heard the words of the living Christ, he became alive. Listen to me. When Pastor Mike is preaching and the Holy Spirit of God is speaking in the third person of God, he's speaking to your heart. He's wanting you to obey to the voice of God to give your life to Jesus Christ that you may become alive and be that moment be born again within your heart. Because you're hearing the words of the living God through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Lazarus restored in verse 44. 
He came bound hand and foot. This is a miracle inside of a miracle. He's been wound tight. Here he is. When Jesus spoke, Lazarus came forth. He was bound. And this illustrates that you are alive. Notice that he said in verse 44 that he needs to be unbound. A man needs liberty. Lazarus was bound in his grave clothes. I like V. I told her I'd flip through his pages when I get them right. Grave clothes are symbolic of the old life. Jesus wants us to understand a spiritual significance. He wants us to understand if they become alive in Christ, it's necessary, listen to me, it's necessary to put off the old man. Romans 12, to be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed, the renewing of your mind. You know what part of Pastor Mike's job is, and my job, and you as older believers? To take these young believers who got saved and help unbound them from the old grave clothes and habits. There's a lot of people in a lot of churches are still bound with the old grave clothes. They talk like they used to when they get upset. Some of them drank like they used to before. They do the things they like they used to before. Here, I want to tell you something. Before my life changed, there was nobody in the Met Lab or in the entire operation of BMW of 2,000 people had a worse filthy mouth than I did. Every word that came out of my mouth almost was a foul cuss word. What mama couldn't do with African soap, Jesus Christ did in one glorious great swoop, cleanse my mouth right at that moment. We need to be free from our grave clothes. And we that have been saved, saved for a number of years need to help unbound people to get rid of those shackles that hold them down for so long. Let me ask you a question. Are you free from the old person in Adam? You say, Brother Larry, you don't understand. I can't help it. I want you to understand that you're rejecting the person in the power of God by saying that. You need to be free. Essential truths comes to your heart. God wants to loose you from the grave clothes. Romans 6. When Pastor Mike baptized, when I was a pastor, let me tell you what I said. When I was baptized a person died, after their profession of faith, they give a little testimony. I said, my brother or sister, by your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now listen to these words. Buried in the likeness of his death. Watch these words. Raised to walk in newness of life. Not like I used to be. Not like I talk, well, I used to talk. Not like what I used to drink. Not like those things. We have been raised to walk in newness of life. There's a new life living within, a new life source. And my friends, he will lead you and guide you into those ways. Lazarus to be, be loosed in his hands for he was to do the work of God. Lazarus was to be loosed in his feet for he was to walk well pleasing to his Lord. Lazarus to have the grave clothes to walk to his, around his mouth so that he may witness for Christ. Next, we find Lazarus is feasting with the Lord. 12, John chapter 12, not many days afterwards, they're in Simon the leper's home and Martha makes a feast and prepares a meal for the Lord. Listen to what it says in verse 2. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. Here it is. Now Lazarus was loved, evangelized, restored, loosed, and now feasting at the table of the Lord. What a tremendous illustration of New Testament life. The reason we have been saved is that we may fellowship with the Lord. B knows oftentimes when I go upstairs to my study, I said, I'll only be up here a little bit. An hour, hour and a half later, I hollered downstairs, hey, I can't help it. I started reading and studying, and I guess can't find a stopping place. Brother Mike, we have the joy and the fun of reading and studying the Word of God. You can't get enough. Amen. My grandson is in seminary and studying. I said, Brendan, isn't it fun to study? Isn't it fun just to learn the Word of God as it fuels our life? Listen, that's feasting with our God in His Word. We have been raised to have a feast with him. And the feast is found in the 66 books of the Bible. By the way, let me challenge you with something. There's not one recorded word in the Bible where Lazarus ever spoke. He didn't have to speak. He spoke with his life. He was words was not convicted by his voice. Lazarus preached with his life. People came to see the man who was raised from the dead. This is the Christian life. A person who was dead in their sins brought to newness in life. I grew up in Ramp Hollow in West Virginia. You either grew up in a hollow, on a mountain, or down at the base of a river somewhere. 
So in that hollow, there was a guy that lived above us named Leonard Kales. Man, was he something else. Bootlegger of bootleggers. He just soon to shoot you as he would to look at you. He was married. He was being as the devil to his wife. She divorced him. But something happened to Leonard. Leonard got saved. I have never seen such a transformation in my life. One of the most authentic Christians I had ever seen. It was a smile on his heart. He would tell everybody he met about what Christ had done for him. He said, man, I was dead. I was vile. I was wretched. I was blind. I was wicked. Now I want you to know that I have come to Christ. He's cleansed my life. He has set me free from the old life. And I want to tell you about this new life that lives within me. And I want to invite you to come to go to heaven with me. You see, the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's a life from above. That's why we can go out here and even though our hearts is broken and when we plant our loved one down into the condominium, if you please, of the dead, down into the grave, we can reach over and kick a little bit of dirt over that grave and say, oh, grave, you think you got Brother Elmer. I want to tell you something. You don't have him because when the voice of God sounds and the trump of God blows, he's going to come out of there more alive than he's ever been in his entire life. And you can walk away from there even though hot tears are streaming down your face because the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees that for us. If you're a Christian, by the way, two thoughts and I'm cl closing. If you're not born again, you have every reason to be fearful of death. Every reason to be fearful of death. If you're a Christian, may the supernatural so characterize your life that others not want to have to come up and say, Brother Mike, are you a Christian? I I've been watching. Are you really? Are you a Christian? They should so look at your life that your life, your good works may glorify your Father which is in heaven. They may see evidence of that, that people do not even have to ask. What a beautiful story. Here we are the Sunday before we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the story of Lazarus, a man who was dead. We were dead in our trespasses of sin, alienated from God, not even seeking after God. And then when God, the Holy Spirit, spoke through us as a man of God, a woman of God, spoke to us in the Word of God, He quickened our spirits and made us alive. There's something that we were never before. We are a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we have hope in the power of the resurrection. Now, I have been so sick on a number of occasions. Even here about a month ago, I thought I was checking out one Tuesday morning. But let me tell you something. I haven't had dying grace. When that dying grace comes, it'll come. But I know this, that even death, if it knocks on my door, I am not afraid to die. I know where I'm going, and I know that I will be a thousand times more alive than ever before. I just ask the Lord this, let me live longer than be. I love her so much, I just want to stay and take care of her. And when she dies, two seconds later, bring me on. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Lazarus. Thank you that the gospel writer of John the Apostle wrote this, that, that Mark did not have it through the through the guidance of Peter, nor did Dr. Luke, nor did Matthew, the disciple. But specifically, you have given it to John to write as an eyewitness to these things. And Lord, as the story is given to us, Jesus did this for one purpose only, that God would be glorified. And Father, you were glorified by this. And even because of Lazarus' resurrection, restored back to life, even the Jews sought to even kill him because of that, to destroy the witness and the power of the Lord. Lord, we have that hope that lives within us today. We have a new life that lives within us, and even though that we know death is at our elbow at all times, yet, Father, we know even though this body dies, we shall be alive and alive forevermore. We thank you for that. We pray for those who are here today that are going through some sad times, Father, that you would bring cheer and joy to the heart. And we look to you regardless of how deep the circumstances may be, how critical it may be, we know within us that where we will be and we will be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor Mike leads us tonight. all stand at this time. The altar's open. I'm so thankful for that message that Brother Larry shared with us. See Lazarus there. Lazarus dies. <laughs> they think the Lord's too late. I'm telling you what, the Lord's never too late. He's always on time. And it amazes me how he just tells them, come forth, and he comes forth. Bound, unwrapping, 
And then right there in the very next chapter in verse 2, there he is eating supper. That's amazing. But that's what God can do in all of our lives. You know that. And I'm so thankful for that. If you have a need tonight, please come. Please come tonight. And all of God's children said, Amen. It's been another great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Appreciate each and every one being here tonight. Just continue to pray for each other. Pray for those on our prayer request list. So much going on. But we still got can give our Lord praise for the goodness of our God that we serve. Remember this week, of course, Bible study. We'll be back starting back up in Acts chapter 5. Is, uh, we'll see sort of a tragedy right there. I know we've been uh, studying Barnabas the last several weeks and encouragement there, but We'll pick up there, Lord willing. Of course, if you got candy or anything, please come by the church. Drop it off at some point in time. Call me. Call Ellen. We'll get that where it needs to be. And then, of course, Saturday we'll be having our uh, Easter celebration here for the kids. And, of course, Sunday services, uh, we know about them. And we'll be sending out uh, calls for that. Anything else before we close tonight? Yes. What time's early? Okay, Tony will be here by 8 o'clock Saturday morning for anybody who wants to bring stuff early. So we'll be around here getting everything ready. Anything else? All hearts clear. God is good. Amen. All the time. All the time. Father, we thank you again for another day you've blessed us with. Just the honor to be able to come back to your house. A Lord, that a place that you've provided, Lord, for us to come, Father, without persecution, Lord. We thank you so much for that, Lord. So many times we take... This life that you blessed us with for granted, Lord. And I'm thankful, Father, for a country, Lord, the United States of America, Lord, that, Father, you allow me to be born in, Father. Lord, I, I'm not proud of what the country's becoming, Lord, but I'm so thankful to be here, Father. And, Lord, I just pray that we would do our part as Christians, Father, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, in these days, Father, it seems evil continues to be all around us, Lord. But I'm thankful, Father, that our citizenship, for those, Lord, that have received you as our personal Savior, our citizenship is not here, Father. Our citizenship is in heaven, at home with you, Lord. And I'm looking forward to that glorious day, Father, when we'll be around the throne room, Father. Lord, we'll be together, Father, to be with you to rule and reign forever and ever. But until then, Father, lead, guide, and direct us, Lord. Help us again, Father, to be bold, Father, for your word, to tell others, Father, 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, as always, Lord, I pray for each family here tonight, Father, as we live here, Lord. Uh, so many accidents, so much going on, Father, that you put a hedge of protection around each family, Lord, Father. And Lord, until the next appointed time, Lord. And Father, again, be with those on our prayer request list again, Lord, Father. So many needs there, Father, that need to be met, Father. But I'm thankful, Father, for the needs that's already been met even now, Lord, in the praise reports. We give you praise and glory for it all, Lord. And as always, we pray it all in the name above every name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.